Hey folks, in this video we're going to look at several examples of fixed point theorems in mathematics. Many problems in mathematics can be solved by finding fixed points of functions. A fixed point of a function f is just a value x such that f of x equals x. In other words, a value mapped to itself by the function. For example, consider the problem of finding a real root of the cubic equation x cubed plus x squared minus 5x minus 3 equals 0. By doing a little algebra, we see that this equation is equivalent to x equals 1 -fifth times the quantity x cubed plus x squared minus 3. So the problem reduces to finding a fixed point of the function f of x equals 1 -fifth times the quantity x cubed plus x squared minus 3. So how do we find a fixed point of f? Well, if we could apply f infinitely many times, starting at any point, then we would have the fixed point x equal to f of f of f, and so on, with infinitely many applications of f. Indeed, we would then have f of x equals f of f of f of f, and so on, which is just x. Sadly, we cannot just apply f infinitely many times like this. But we can approximate this idea. We have a proposition. Let f from r to r be continuous, and x1 and r be an arbitrary point. If the sequence of points x1, x2, which is defined to be f of x1, x3, which is defined to be f of x2, and so on, converges to the point x in R, then f of x is equal to x, that is, x is a fixed point of f. The proof is a one-liner using convergence of the sequence and continuity of f. But how do we know that the sequence of points converges? One way to know is if f contracts points. A function f from r to r is a contraction if there is a constant c less than 1 such that the distance between f of x and f of y is at most c times the distance between x and y for all points x and y in r. Intuitively, a contraction decreases the distance between points. A contraction is always continuous, in fact, uniformly continuous. This leads us to Banach's fixed point theorem, also known as the contraction mapping theorem. It says that if f is a contraction, then f has a unique fixed point. Moreover, if x1 is an arbitrary point, then the sequence obtained by repeatedly applying f, starting at x1, converges to that fixed point. This theorem generalizes to arbitrary complete metric spaces and has many important applications. In logic, fixed points yield self-referential statements. For a formula phi in the language of piano arithmetic, let corner quote phi denote its girdle number. In what follows, we don't distinguish between numbers and numerals. We then have Carnap's fixed point lemma, also known as the diagonal lemma. For any formula phi with one free variable x, there is a sentence psi such that piano arithmetic proves the equivalence psi if and only if phi of psi, where we are here substituting the girdle number of psi for the free occurrences of x in phi. Intuitively, psi says I have property phi. Up to provable equivalence, psi is a fixed point for the operation of substitution into phi. So, how can we construct such a sentence psi? Well, if we could substitute phi into itself infinitely many times, then we could define the sentence psi equal to phi of phi of phi and so on, with infinitely many substitutions of phi. We would then have phi of psi equals phi of phi of phi of phi and so on, which is just psi. So certainly in this case, piano arithmetic would prove the equivalence psi if and only if phi of psi. To make this idea work, we use the substitution function sub, defined so that sub of the girdle number of phi of x and the number m is the girdle number of the sentence obtained by substituting m for the free occurrences of x in phi. This function is computable and hence representable in piano arithmetic. Notice that we can take m to be the girdle number of phi of x to get phi substituted into itself, which begins to approximate our idea. To simulate infinitely many substitutions, we define theta of x to be phi of sub xx, and then define psi to be the sentence obtained by substituting theta into itself. Notice that the definition of theta includes a self-substitution operation on x within phi, using a term representing the substitution function. 
In the definition of psi, when we substitute theta into itself, we intuitively obtain phi applied to the very same substitution operation we just performed, namely psi. This suggests that psi should be equivalent to phi of psi. Indeed, we can prove in piano arithmetic that psi is equivalent to phi of psi. It's worth pausing the video and thinking through each step of this proof carefully. At this point, we can easily prove Gödel's first incompleteness theorem. It says that if piano arithmetic is consistent, that is, if it doesn't prove a contradiction, then it admits true but unprovable statements. Indeed, by the fixed point lemma, there is a sentence psi for which piano arithmetic proves the equivalence, psi if and only if not pi of psi, where pi of x says x is the girdle number of a sentence provable in piano arithmetic. Note that this property pi is expressible in the language of arithmetic because proofs themselves are just finitary objects which can be encoded as numbers. So psi says, I am not provable. Now, if piano arithmetic proves psi, then it proves that psi is provable. So by definition of psi, it also proves not psi, which contradicts the assumption of consistency. Therefore, psi is not provable. But that's just what psi says, so it's also true. It is remarkable that the Gödel sentence psi, which showcases a fundamental limitation of the axiomatic method in mathematics, is just another example of a fixed point. In the lambda calculus, fixed point combinators allow us to define recursive functions. Consider the problem of defining a recursive term g so that gx equals x of xg for all terms x. How can we define such a g? We would have what we want if g equaled the term lambda x x of xg, which is just the result of applying the term lambda yx x of xy to g. So the problem reduces to finding a fixed point of the term lambda yx x of xy. Given an arbitrary term f, how can we find a fixed point of f? Well, if infinite terms were allowed, we could just take x equal to f of f of f and so on, with f repeated infinitely many times. We would then have fx equal to f of f of f of f, and so on, which is just x. Sadly, infinite terms are not allowed. But we can construct a term which generates infinitely many f's under reduction. First, consider the term little omega, defined to be lambda x x x, and big omega, defined to be little omega little omega. Notice that big omega reduces to itself infinitely since nothing changes during each reduction step. Again, it's worth pausing the video to think through this. If we introduce f into little omega, we can generate an f at each reduction step of big omega. Let little omega f be lambda x f of x x, where x does not occur free in f, and let big omega f be little omega f little omega f then it's easy to see that big omega f reduces to f of big omega f. In other words, big omega f is a fixed point of f. We can generalize this to obtain Curry's y combinator. Here y f is a fixed point of f for any term f. The proof just abstracts the previous construction over the variable f. But the y combinator is not the only fixed point combinator. For example, we might have interchanged the order of lambda f and lambda x in the definition of the y combinator to obtain a, which is defined to be lambda xf, f of xxf, and theta, which is defined to be a a. Then it's easy to see that theta f is a fixed point of f. This is Turing's fixed point combinator, and it has certain advantages over the y combinator. There are also infinitely many others. Again, we see the power and ubiquity of fixed points in mathematics. In each of these constructions of fixed points, the intuitive idea involved an illustrative but illegitimate infinitary operation, which was approximated or simulated by a legitimate finitary one, whether that was taking a limit of a sequence of function applications, or performing a recursive self-substitution in an arithmetic formula, or performing a recursive self-application of a lambda term. This is reminiscent of Aristotle's use of the potential infinite as opposed to the actual infinite. Although the actually infinite operations may be problematic, the merely potentially infinite ones are fine, and yield the desired results. 
This pattern is visible in the proofs of many other fixed-point theorems in mathematics. Here are the references I used while making this video. Thanks for watching.